No, thank you, uh, Martin, for the uh, for the invitation to speak tonight. So obviously I've been tasked tonight to really give you a flavour of UK PSE and how it all began. And really, I'm going to take you back to 2006 when I certainly was a lot slimmer and had more hair. And I was tasked by my mentor in Cambridge, Adam Brooks Hospital, Graham Alexander, shown at the bottom left of the screen there, to take up and run the Apato Billary Clinic at Cambridge, really because I had a love for liver disease, but I also had a passion for doing biliary endoscopy, and particularly doing ERCP. And in 2006, well, we knew some things about PSC. We sort of knew it was slightly more common in male patients. We sort of knew that about 80% of patients had associated inflammatory bowel disease. And we sort of knew, as shown on this screen here, that the disease resulted in inflammation and scarring of multiple areas of the bile ducts, both inside and outside the liver, that sort of led to the complications that I was seeing in the clinic. That was episodes of bile duct infections, cholangitis, sadly for some patients, an increased risk of bile duct cancer. And if the disease caused progressive scarring in the liver, it was associated with the development of what doctors call portal hypertension, when patients can get fluid on the tummy and form varices. And ultimately for some patients, sadly, the development of liver failure and the need for liver transplantation. And what was also clear sitting in the clinic back then in 2006 was that, you know, a fair number of patients had another autoimmune disease, but Perhaps more importantly, this, you know, I had some patients that were completely well and had been well for many, many years. And there were some patients that had a very, you know, a very quick progressive illness and had come to transplantation very quickly. And I think what I began to realize in 2008, having done the clinic for two years, is I knew very little about this disease in terms of its etiology and its cause. And it was essentially a bit of a mystery box, you know, a lot of liver diseases had been explained very well, where PSC really had many unanswered questions as to what caused it. And therefore, I really went to my mentor, Professor Graham Alexander, and said, look, I really think we could do something in the UK. And this, the reason that I was starting to think the way I did was I could see that people, inflammatory bowel disease had really moved forward through the development of patient registries and large cohorts. And Graham obviously said to me, well, look, why don't you go and talk to the, you know, if that uh, as still is one of the world's leading experts, Roger Chapman in Oxford, and also put me in touch through a chance meeting with Professor Tom Carlson. And it was really the four of us that had this idea that we could set up and do something in the UK to develop a large cohort of patients and a registry to try and move forward our understanding of PSC. And that's really in 2008 when it started. We set up UK PSC and our primary aims at that point, and obviously Palak will talk a little bit of how the studies moved on now, but our aims at that point were really to create a UK patient registry. We wanted to collect very high level clinical data on the vast range of patients that the UK had and at the same time, collect DNA samples via blood or via saliva to try and isolate and build a biobank of DNA, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Now, what was clear to me if we were going to do this study, you know, at the time back of you, and it seems a long time ago, but in 2006, 2008, most of the literature in PSC was all about single centre. There's a picture of my hospital on the left, you know, everyone wrote up their own data. But the problem with that approach was that it only covered a few hundred patients. You know, it didn't cover thousands of patients. So what we set up in Cambridge, where I was at the time, is we created Central Research Project Team funded by Professor Carlson and also Roger Trapman with the support uh, of PSC. <clears throat> and we got ethical approval to approach every site in the country and enable us to go out and find every patient in the country to try and fulfill our research aims. 
What that really meant for me, because I was the one doing the work, is that I made a list of every NHS trust in the country, which at the time wasn't easy. I had to go on the internet and find them all. I then had to phone up each hospital and find who was the hepatologist there or the gastroenterologist, and then wrote them an email asking, would they like to take part in this idea that the four of us had had? I then, if they gave us permission to, and they, every one step forward, they were extremely helpful. We then applied for them to have ethical permission at their center to take part in the study, having had, if you like, centralized ethical approval to run it. And by 2010, we essentially had run this study and recruited nearly 1,700 patients, which is phenomenal if you think about it. I mean, it's estimated that there might be somewhere between six and 8,000 patients in the UK with PSC. And within two years, we'd essentially almost found about a third of them, okay, to a quarter, depending on how many patients you think there are in the UK. Now, what were we going to study? Having done all this work, we've collected a huge number of patients. We thought, what should we look at? And really, at the time, there was this sort of understanding that PSC was considered a complex disease in terms of why it came about in certain individuals. And what you mean by that is that there's probably this strong interaction of genetic risk factors in a patient's DNA in combination with lifestyle choices. And we know some of those for PSC, for example, the protection of cigarette smoking or caffeine may delay disease onset. And obviously a combination of environmental factors, which are likely when we think probably things like bacteria and possibly viruses and other things that live in the gut. But the focus originally of PSA UK was really focused on perhaps moving forward our genetic understanding of the causation of primary sclerosing cholangitis. So why did we want to focus on, uh, well, genetics? Why is genetics so important? Well, the reason is that there was a great deal of thought that if you could identify the genes that are associated with PSC, then there's a good chance that you might find new drug targets. And in fact, that's lived through to even now. In fact, if you go to the Sanger Center, there's a large cohort of people that form the Open Targets Program that are there to find genetic targets that cause disease with the belief that if you can understand that, you're much more likely to find a successful drug that will come to market. So understanding the genetic substrate of a condition hopefully will lead you to a much higher likelihood of finding a drug. So what did we do with all these DNA samples with our intention to study and find the genetic causation of PSC. Well, the first thing that I would like to do is just give you a little bit of a background on DNA, because this is not everyone knows a lot about it. And to remind you, our genetic information, that's our DNA, is found within an area of the cell called the nucleus. So this is a diagrammatic representation of a cell. And the little purple circle in the middle is our nucleus, where most of our DNA is found, OK? And that's the site where we keep our genetic code. Now, it turns out that our genetic code is organized into these things called chromosomes. And here's a little picture of the human chromosomes. You can see that there's 23 pairs of chromosomes labeled 1 to 23. And each pair essentially consists of two chromosomes, one that's come from your mum and one that's come from your father. And you can see they, they are different in their length. Interestingly, the chromosome pair 23 are the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y chromosome, that determines whether we're a boy or a girl. Now, in terms of DNA and the studies that we wanted to do, the reason we're so interested in DNA is because DNAs are like our recipe book. It's the recipe book that determines the types of proteins that we make. And biologists and doctors talk about this thing called the central dogma of biology. And that is where your DNA, which you can think of as a recipe book for making things, is converted into these things called RNA. And you can think of that as like a photocopy of the cookbook that tells you how to make things. 
And then the RNA, which is like the photocopy of the DNA, tells you how to make the cakes, which in this, in biology, is the protein. And really the proteins are the things that determine how cells function and how cells work. So there's this constant flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein. And if we look at DNA in a little bit more detail, for those of you that have not seen pictures of DNA, and this is one molecule of DNA on a chromosome, you can see that it's essentially made up of two ladders that are intertwined around each other. So on the right hand side of this diagram, you can see the blue ladders which intertwine with each other. And between those two lines of blue, you can see that there's little ladders or the rungs of the ladder. And those are called the bases. And you can see that there are four bases in, here, in DNA. There's one called A, called adenine. There's one called T, called thiamine. There's one called C, called cytosine. And there's one called G, called guanine. And basically, they pair up. So A is always paired with T, and C is always paired with G. And you can see that there on the left, you can see a little picture of the two rungs of DNA with those ladders in between. And in fact, you've got about, if you look, if you think of there's 40, <coughs> if you think about the number of chromosomes, we've got two sets of chromosomes, I say one from our mum, one from our dad, each set has got about 3 billion of these little letters. So that's what the genetic code is. Now it turns out that if you look at the genetic code, there are some areas of the genetic code which code for our genes, and genes are what codes proteins, and those are the things that we think might be important in disease causation, modification of certain genes in certain cells. And there's areas of the DNA that doesn't code for anything. They're called non-coding regions. So your DNA has got areas where no genes are found, called non-coding areas, and there's areas where there's genes. And perhaps what's more important, and perhaps um, for those of you that have not had a chance to study DNA, if I, we took these three people here in this cartoon that I'm showing you here, the purple man, the blue man, the orange man, you can see that a lot of the genetic code between three individuals or between, you know, this is just a small example, is exactly identical. But there are certain areas as you move along. So if you imagine reading those letters, G, C and A, is present in all three people, but then we get to an area that's different. And those little areas of difference in our genetic code, which are given the name polymorphisms, are what makes you and I different. So if you take that there's six billion letters, about six million letters in your genetic code is unique to you and different, and that's what makes us different. And the importance of understanding that is those act as little beacons where we can, if you like, look along the DNA and we can use those little, little beacons to read it and define areas of the DNA. And you can think of DNA in the best way I'm connect, and I'm trying to explain this to people who have never studied it before, as little bricks. You know, I want you to imagine these are two people's DNA strands, okay, and we can divide them into little bricks. And those little bricks, I'm going to give the name haplotype. So you've got your long genetic code on each chromosome, and each chromosome, the little day you can divide into these little bricks called haplotypes, because those little bricks are how we can break down the genetic code. And what you can do is, and that's exactly what we did in our study, is we took hundreds, or in this case, we took thousands of people with PSC, and those are our cases with the disease, and we compared them to people without PSC. And this work that I'm describing to you was using the samples that you all very kindly donated. This work that I'm describing to you was undertaken by my colleague, Carl Anderson, in collaboration internationally, who led this study, who is really the, you know, an expert in these sorts of studies. So we have to thank Carl for the information that him and his team elucid to and found for us. But the important thing is, how does this work? Well, imagine that we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of genetic codes from people with PSC. And imagine we've got hundreds and hundreds of codes from people with not PSC. And I want you to imagine we're looking at this little bit of DNA here. These are two areas, all right? And I imagine that we're looking at this area here, okay? So this is a chromosome. This is your mum, 
this is your dad, okay? Now, if it turns out, okay, when we look at the PSC group versus the non-PSC group, that there's lots of ones here, disproportionate, and there's lots of two in the non-PSC group, what that means is that there might be something in the one bit here that's highlighting that there are some genes in there that are important, okay? So by looking, if you like, at little blocks and seeing up, are the blocks overrepresented in your patients? You can say that bit of the DNA is where some crucial genes might be that are associated with PSC. And that's exactly what we did. So what did we learn? Well, the first thing that we learned is we found a number of genetic areas that seem to be associated with the development of PSC, okay? In fact, we found over 20 of them, okay? And what we learned, first of all, is that the genetic makeup of patients with PSC and inflammatory bowel disease is very different to people with just inflammatory bowel disease without PSC. And I think that what that tells you is what we know, that colitis associated with PSC is genetically unique and clinically unique. We all know that the inflammatory bowel associated with PSC is more right-sided. It tends to stop, doesn't tend to involve the tail end, the rectum. It does sadly have a higher risk of cancer. And now understanding that, that it clinically looks different, we now that it know that it genetically looks different. And what that probably should tell us is that there's probably lots of people which has been shown in a number of studies as demonstrated here, that have just colitis that are harboring the genetic makeup that's causing or associated with the development of that colitis, which means that they essentially have PSE colitis, they just don't know it. And that's true a lot of our patients. You know, a lot of you have had colitis in the clinic and it's not till your liver tests have become abnormal that your PSE has been diagnosed. So I think one thing this has taught us is as a community is we really need to start thinking of PSC colitis as a unique disease entity. And we should need to develop better tools to recognize that PSC colitis is, you know, is PSC before the liver tests become abnormal. I think the other thing it taught us is that essentially PSC is a autoimmune disease. You know, I know that sounds an odd statement, but there was lots of debate about what sort of disease PSV was in the literature. And because a lot of the genetic risk factors of PSC are identical to genetic risk factors associated with other autoimmune diseases, it does give you some confidence that this is a typical autoimmune disease. Now, this, if you imagine this little plot here, what it shows you is the hits that we found along the different chromosomes. And that big peak in the middle highlights an area on chromosome six called the HLA region. And that really does drive home because HLA is so important in the development of autoimmune disease. It really does drive home that this is an autoimmune disease. And in fact, we found lots of HLAs that cause or associated with risk and protective. It also drives home that we're dealing with an inflammatory disease. You know, I think a lot of our drug therapies and the new drug therapies are really focused, if we're honest, on bile salts and bile salt metabolism. We haven't really yet remembered or looked at the potential of treating PSC with inflammatory drugs. Because as shown here, this is a spyglass that we've done. You can see in A, this is a very inflamed bile duct. This is lots of inflammation. And on in B, there's lots of scarring as a result of that. We need to basically really start to look at therapies that target the immune system. And we now have lots of areas of the gene which we're going to take forward as a group. And we're going to look at these and see if we understand them. The other important thing about it is we're starting to understand a bit more about the fundamental changes that occur in the immune system as a result of these genetic changes that we've identified. And you can think of your immune system as lots of soldiers. And as with any army, there's good guys and there's bad guys. And the good guys that are there to turn off the immune system, which I'm gonna call the T-regs, are basically doing battle against the bad guys who want to shoot everyone, which are the TH17 cells there. 
And there is this constant battle between good and bad going on in the body. And perhaps some of the genetic changes associated with PSE are tipping that seesaw, favoring the bad guys winning over the good guys. In addition, some of the genetic changes that we found perhaps also tell us that another type of uh, player in our immune system called the B cells that produce antibodies, which can destroy tissues, are being turned on by these cells called T follicular cells. So I don't expect everyone to understand this, but what I'm trying to get to the point is to you is that by understanding some of these genetic changes, we're able to go back and understand how they might be affecting our immune system and therefore telling us perhaps some of the drugs that we might want to challenge and see if they work in PSC. And also as a result of this work particularly, you need to remember that it, if it's an autoimmune disease, it, we can go and learn lots of things from other autoimmune diseases where there's lots of information for us to study, okay? Type one diabetes, celiac disease, all these things overlap. And perhaps more importantly, and this is something that um, PSC support is very finely funded, often in autoimmune diseases, there are disease specific antibodies that you can measure in the bloodstream and help you identify disease early. So there might be an opportunity to see if there are disease specific antibodies using new techniques. And we are getting some very exciting data, myself and Emma Culver, with work that's been supported by Martine. So I think these genetic results have many applications. We're only beginning to understand and look at it, but it's all come from the DNA that's been very kindly donated from patients that have taken part in the study. Now, to finish up, I just want to tell you about how we've used some of the data from the um, analyses and that we've collected as well. And one of the important things that I wanted to do along with others was use the clinical data that we had um, collected from around the UK on a range of patients to try and help us develop better disease models to help us understand the natural progression of PSC and could we predict that? And as you know, there are many models out there that doctors can use to say if a patient's going to do well or do bad. I mean, there are many there. Obviously, the most famous one is probably the revised Mayo risk score that a lot of us know uh, from the literature. But there are many problems with these studies and there are many limitations. First of all, many of these um, basic studies that were done were done with a limited number of patients, perhaps with biasing in terms of the patients that were there. Obviously, you have to account for multiple types of PSC. You know, some patients with PSC have inflammatory bowel disease, some don't. Some have autoimmune hepatitis overlap, some don't. So all these things we have to factor in. We obviously have to understand the disease, how it varies between individuals. And we basically have to decide which endpoints we're going to study and make in our models. Are we going to look at cancer? Are we going to look at um, the need for transplantation? Are we going to look at non-transplantation death? So you've got to make some decisions what you're going to look at as your end goal and what are the factors that you're going to study to see how they influence your end goals. We also have to account in PSE that patients present at different stages. You know, there are sadly some patients who present to us with quite late disease where they have quite a lot of scarring. And there are some patients that present to us at a very early stage of disease. And therefore, if you're going to develop models, it's very hard to accept that one model is going to cater for all those different patients who are presenting to your clinic. So perhaps what you want to do is for those patients presenting with more advanced disease, develop a model that's much more about the short term risk, which might be very much different factors to looking at a model for a patient that presents with quite early onset disease, where they're going to have a much longer trajectory. And they are going to probably be different factors driving that patient's progression. So we want to develop models, a short term risk model and a long term risk model to really account for those two different groups of patients that are presenting to the clinic. So the aims of this study that was done with the information that patients consented to was essentially to develop these models. And what we did, and this work was really driven by my colleague Liz Good, who worked at Cambridge and also worked at Norwich with myself. And Liz really drove forward the development of over a thousand patients and collected their clinical data. 
And what she was able to do was she was able to basically develop some basic epidemiological information about the mice and disease characteristics that look very typical to what had been described elsewhere. And what was lovely about this study is it wasn't transplant center dominated. You know there are many of you out there who have very mild disease and there are some of you that sadly have more advanced disease. We wanted a risk score that accounted for everyone that wasn't just focused on perhaps if you like skewed patient groups that, that accumulate obviously in centers of excellent transplant centers where they need to be. So we wanted a disease model that accounted for all our patients. And what was interesting is for the short term model, we found that things that predicted outcome were things that would make sense. The more jaundice you were, the more likely you were to come to harm. The lower your albumin, your blood count or your platelet count, things that doctors measure regularly in the clinic tells us that you're going to not do so well. And we could put that into a mathematical formula to try and accurately predict the short term outcome over two years of a patient with some of the best statistics out there for disease models. Likewise, if we wanted to look at the group that were, you know, the patients that presented likely well at a relatively early stage of their disease and look at their 10 year outcome much further out than two years, then there was different things that came out, you know, the age at which you present at, whether your disease affects the bile tube outside the liver was important. Once again, jaundice was important, the level of bilirubin. But interestingly now, ALKFOS, that blood test that you all have measured every time you go to the clinic, the, the degree of how raised it was started to come out as a risk factor. And once again, albumin, platelets, and whether any varices have bled in the two years after you presented. And once again, we could construct a mathematical model that very accurately predicted long-term outcomes. So trying to cater for two different needs for two different patient groups. What was interesting as well is, and what is often still talked about, is this ALKFOS, this blood test we all have measured regularly when patients come to the clinic. And really Roger um, and the group at Oxford had already set out very nicely that perhaps the degree of elevation of your alkaline phosphatase might be an important predictor of outcome. You can see here on that little graph on the right hand side that those with the low ALKFOS tended to do better than those with the raised ALKFOS above 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. And we wanted to look at that in the UK data set that we collected. And we found a similar thing that, you know, if you wanted to pick a level of ALKFOS that probably meant something meaningful in terms of trying to stratify patients into who's going to do well and who's going to not do so well. Using a sort of threshold at one year of an outfoss at about two and a half times the upper limit and normal of what's measured in your laboratory at your hospital was not a bad thing. We could do the same at two years where the level of outfoss was about 2.2 times. So my point is, these early biochemical readings for patients during their clinical journey with PSC probably do mean something. And they probably do tell us a little bit about who's doing well and perhaps who may come to some disease endpoint of interest. And of course, there are a number of groups now that have done similar things. You know, there is the Amsterdam Oxford model. There's also the PRES2 model from the Mayo group. Okay. So, this idea of using large data sets to develop models to help us stratify risk into good group patients and bad group patients is important because ultimately I think patients do like to know what's their disease journey. And also it helps us predict and try and prepare them for that disease journey. So there is a huge amount of interest and use and really work with Palak who you're about to hear from in a moment and once again, Professor Hirschfield in Canada, now Toronto, all this data that's been collected around the world is being pulled together to try and develop better disease models for patients. And I think this is an excellent opportunity. So I really want to say thank you to you all. I think it's really this growing understanding through clinical collaboration, but most importantly, patient clinician collaboration that's allowed a lot of these big studies to develop and flourish and really i'd like to thank everyone for what they've uh, contributed to and allow us to achieve and 
what I hope Alex's now going to do for us, he's going to tell us a little about how PSC UK's evolve and where we are now and what we're going to get to. So Palak, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. That was a, an absolutely amazing sort of presentation. Uh, and I, I always learn something when I listen to you, um, even if it's stuff that you've, you've presented in a slightly different way. So very well presented. And um, now, first of all, I want to say happy PSC Day to you all. Now, you may wonder why I'm saying happy PSC Day. Well, I think at the moment, um, it may not feel like it, but certainly it, there's never been a better time to have PSC compared to when you did before. And the reason I say that it's not just because the research activity that Simon, myself, Martin, Maxine and others are driving, but also because I'm, I'm very confident that we will have a treatment for PSC sort of, it's sort of on the horizon very soon. And that's because clinical trial activity has never been as ripe, as busy as it is right now. And I want to touch upon a few clinical trials um, that are currently ongoing, both um, here in the UK as well as elsewhere. And particularly why I think it's very important to, to take part. Uh, this is a, um, a graph showing the recruitment of uh, people across the UK PSC sort of cohort. And in orange, you can see the total recruitment and, uh, and the sort of turquoise sort of blue, depending on what sort of screen you have, you can see the year on year recruitment. Now, we do expect a plateau as time goes on uh, as more and more people register right at the very beginning, there'll be less and less of you who need to re-register as time evolves. However, the plateau is perhaps a little flatter than Simon and I would like, and so please do approach your centres to register to UK PSC, and, and I'll explain why it's very important to do this as time goes on. Now, this is the naming and shaming bit, and the naming bit, so this illustrates the top recruiting sites for UK PSC. Now, the reason I'm sort of I'm putting this up here is I don't for a second believe that it is purely the responsibility for any investigator to approach you. I think in the current day and age, it's really important to take ownership and empower yourself to say, right, I have PSC, I have a rare condition. You are telling me there's no treatment for it. I, I want better. I want better from you as my physician. I want better from you as a person looking after me. And, I want, and the reason I want to enroll into UK PSC is so that I can get access to early treatments, to clinical trials, to the best research as soon as it is available. And I believe that the only way you're going to do that is by being part of UK PSC, because this is where the latest developments are at the forefront. And this is the shaming bit. So not shaming colleagues, but shaming hospitals. The fact, and it's just showing that actually, despite some of these being very large hospitals, there is very little recruitment to UK PSC from them. So if you're a, a, a patient who is being looked after any of these hospitals and you have PSC and you have not been approached, please do approach your consultant to be enrolled into UK PSC. Now, Simon mentioned earlier on that the study initially started off um, as looking for genetic causes of the disease. Now, the scope has been broadened significantly, not just by, uh, because we're in, now including children who are diagnosed with PSC, but also because we're collecting samples. We are collecting samples that see, right, one patient group has presented with inflammatory bowel disease. How do their samples differ from those who present without inflammatory bowel disease? How do people with PSC and ulcerative colitis type information in their bowel differ from those who've got primary sclerosing cholangitis and more of a Crohn's disease type appearance. Are they the same? Are they different? Should we rename it, as Simon suggests, as, as just one umbrella classification of PSC and inflammatory bowel disease? And there are some of you who present with autoimmune hepatitis that tends to evolve to more of a primary sclerosing cholangitis type picture. What does that mean? Does your blood look different to those people who had PSC all along? And very importantly, something very close to all our hearts is how do your blood samples reflect how are you feeling, your quality of life, your mental health, your well-being? And, beyond, and, and Simon presented some data about the UK PSC Risk School, which is really a landmark paper that, ena that enables us as clinicians to give you an objective idea of how likely are you to need a transplant or unfortunately uh, um, sort of... Uh, develop complications from your PSC and that enables us to then say right you should be enrolled into a particular clinical trial because we have no treatment that currently works 
but because you are a high risk individual, we think you should be enrolled. Or does your risk score suggest at, at the moment your PSC is relatively well controlled, there is a bit of time, we should still look after you, but I'm not going to refer you to a, a transplant centre because your time is not quite right yet. Importantly, there is lots of variation in, uh, in how we look after you, uh, you and uh, your loved ones with PSC. So it's important to develop consensus guidelines. And the, I'm very proud to sort of say that the UK has been one of the countries, one of the few countries in the world that has its own guideline set for managing PSC. Now, guidelines are only as good as the point at which they're developed. And these will continue to improve as time goes on. So I'm not going to talk about Simon and Elizabeth Good's paper, but just to highlight one of the things that your patients, you know, your samples, your blood samples, your your blood work that you have performed at your centre has contributed to is development and validation of one of the world's first validated risk scoring systems. Doug Sorbonne and colleagues in London are working on um, a study looking at the well-being. How does PSC as a condition affect sort of your well-being, not just with regard to whether you need a transplant or whether you have a high risk of developing cancer, but also in terms of mental health, psychological well-being. And together with colleagues in King's uh, um, Hospital London, we're now also exploring how does PSC, how does IBD impact the things that are important to you, like sexual function, fertility, and the risk of inheritance to your children. This is just to highlight sort of the, re the recent uh, UK um, guidelines. Um, I, sort of, I do sort of advise everyone sort of whether you, uh, whether you look after people with PSC or whether you're a PSC patient or a relative to have a quick look at this particular summary to ensure that you are receiving you know, the bare minimum of, uh, sort of, of standard of care, if not more because there are many individuals who, and I'll come to show you, have different standards of care across the UK, and that does impact how you do, that does impact um, long-term outcomes. PSC Support have recently um, uh, funded a study as part of UK PSC called the PSC 600. At the moment, our UK PSC um, study collects samples at one time point, i.e. the point of diagnosis, we are now looking to collect samples every year. Now, why are we looking to collect samples every year? And why are we looking to expand beyond blood, looking at stool, looking at imaging, looking at your, looking at your colonoscopy? Well, blood tests only tell us one part. They're only really one part of the jigsaw. What we were trying to do is say, rather than just measure blood points at test at one time, is it more meaningful to see how do your blood tests change over time? And is the change more important than the single measure? If you are somebody who's been diagnosed 10 years down the line and you come to see me or Simon for the very first time, me telling you what your risk was 10 years ago perhaps means very little compared to, you would probably wanna know what it is like now. And has that risk changed? Have you been looked after in the right way? How have your blood tests changed? In a similar vein, we, there is lots more data now than there was 10 years ago about how the gut bacteria, how the amount of inflammation in your bowel affects what your liver is doing and vice versa. But again, lots of these measures are collected at a single time point. How does the evolution over time uh, 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 impact our pr prediction? Now the term audit may be familiar to some of you, but in essence, it's looking to see how uh, the current practice measures against what's set up in the guidelines. Now, this is led by a bunch of junior doctors uh, um, from Norwich, Birmingham and London. And what we're trying to see is not just how your liver disease is managed, but also how the uh, inflammatory bowel disease is managed. And this, current, this study is currently ongoing. And we want to see that if you have inflammatory bowel disease and your liver bloods were diagnosed as uh, was or identified as being abnormal, were they acted on in a timely way? Was there a delay to your PSC diagnosis? Was the appropriate investigations conducted? And if your PSC was diagnosed first, were you offered a colonoscopy? Were you offered a colonoscopy every year? And, ha and how has that colonoscopy been performed? Have we been looking for the right things? Have we, have we been quantifying the activity of inflammation in the right way? All of these things are very important aspects of clinical care. And, this, and we are now looking across the UK as part of UK PSC as to whether which hospitals are doing things right and which aren't. Now I want to touch upon sort of um, some studies that are slightly more mature in their evolution, but I'm just highlighting a few sort of bullet points. 
just to sort of uh, uh, before I sort of go to the next few slides, I touched very briefly upon uh, autoimmune hepatitis and PSD as overlap. Um, many of you, particularly of younger age when you were diagnosed, would have been that, that term would have been thrown about. But what does it mean? Does an overlap presentation between autoimmune hepatitis and PSD have different implications compared to those people who are diagnosed with PSD alone? I've mentioned the PSC 600. How is, you know, how is the occurrence of PSC changing across England? What's the cost to the NHS? Now, you may not be concerned about cost because the NHS is a, is, is a free uh, um, healthcare service, but when it comes to licensing new medications, the cost is incredibly important because the Department of Health and, uh, and NHS England will not allow a drug to enter the market if it costs more than the current standard of care. So we need to know what the cost of looking after you is so drug companies can set their price points that are acceptable. I mentioned about the PSC uh, um, IBD audit. We've also recently completed a survey looking at how IBD care is after you're transplanted because many of you don't tend to see an inflammatory bowel disease specialist after you're transplanted. And that's something that we need to find out why and whether it matters. And does the mode at which we um, survey for cancer, both in the bowel and the liver, impact how you do? What you're all interested in is a cure for PSC. And there is a wealth of activity, both early stage in terms of stool transplantation, using antibiotics like vancomycin, but also repurposing other medications that we use in other liver diseases, such as bezafibrate, which is a drug used to treat cholesterol. But now there is some emerging data that it helps improve itch and it also helps improve liver blood tests. And there are also trials that are led by drug companies, which we're leading throughout UK PSC, Nora, Sodioxicolic Acid, Silofexor. The names aren't really important, but just to highlight that these are very advanced in their development, perhaps as advanced in their development as the COVID vaccine. And beyond pruritus, we're interested in looking at what the best modes of treatment are with regards to fatigue. 